I uh, sadly didn't go to UT, but I'm a, I uh, bleed orange. My dad uh, got his PhD from the marketing department that I'm now chairman of. Uh, I lived on a street called Sabine, and it's where the LBJ library is. So they've torn my house down. I went to John B. Wynn Elementary School where Dishfault Field is, and they've torn that down. Uh, it used to be Central Avenue. Some of you may remember that. Um, and so, uh, but I, I uh, came here in 71 and uh, have funeral plots, so I'm, I'm here to stay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how many of you uh, are from the business school? Okay, great. How about uh, liberal arts? All right, excellent. How about natural sciences? Okay, very good. Uh, their college communication? Okay, uh, and very good. And uh, there are a bunch of smaller ones that I hope I didn't mention, forget any big ones. Uh, we have an engineering school here, huh? Okay. All right. No, I, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great, a great school, good Cockrell School, of course. So that's great. Uh, ed, yeah, education, that's great. Fine arts. Fine arts. I got myself in trouble, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And uh, nursing is anybody from nursing? There you go. History. His, yeah, history. Good. Um, also. Uh, there's a lot, you know, we, academics, uh, professors have to be scholarly. So a lot of my best work has been uh, uh, published with a pseudonym. Because if you write something that's popular, it's not, it's not viewed as being scholarly. So, but you may be familiar with some of the books I wrote. Uh, this was some years ago, but do you remember the one, I'm okay, you're mediocre? That was me. Uh, another one uh, that I that I was my big financial se success was the One Minute Lover, and uh, that went real that really so well. Especially guys liked it. Uh, I'm now working on a history of University of Texas, and I have recently come across. A little known fact that uh, in the early days before we were uh, the Longhorns, we were the unicorns. Anybody know that? <laughs> but uh, we got so much pressure from the other schools, we had to change. Uh, they didn't like our hand gesture. <laughs> so anyway, I thought we should have rolled that out uh, the other night after the LSU game. But <laughs> anyway, I guess we have to be good sports. Uh, on a slightly more serious note, I uh, think this is a, a magnificent organization in Texas Texas, and I have the honor of serving on occasionally on a, the committees that award scholarships. And it is uh, at the same time both a, an extremely rewarding experience and a sad one as well. Uh, because we see so many remarkable students that you all are helping in material ways, and it's really delightful to be able to uh, help some of these young men and women. And just this, uh, this spring, I, I did that, and I remember one uh, student in particular. Uh, he is uh, Hispanic from the Valley, he has a sister in high school, the uh, single mom. Their family income on his form was $18,000. Uh, he is a, uh, a senior uh, this coming fall in accounting. I think he has over a 3.9 uh, GPA. His... Uh, application said his mother's 
uh, job was as a machine operator. And I asked him what he meant about that, and he seemed sort of embarrassed. And he told me that, uh, or he told the committee, that uh, she worked in a, a plant that made the little plastic things that hold seat belts in place. And it's dirty, nasty uh, factory work, and she doesn't like to talk about it. And I told him that that is noble work, what she's doing, supporting her son to go to college. And when you think about it, he had every reason not to. But he uh, is doing brilliantly, and he's going to change the social class of that family. You can be assured, his, in fact, he said so, his sister will be coming to UT. And they're making a quantum shift in their economic status. And uh, if he didn't have scholarship money, or to the extent he doesn't have scholarship money, he's going to have to be working at McDonald's or somewhere uh, to support himself. So those of you who are contributing to those scholarships, I really commend you. I was just got back from uh, New York last night, and uh, I went up with about 15 people from the business school, and we were calling on uh, primarily big investment banks and uh, trying to solidify our relationship with them that, to ensure that they will hire UT students when things uh, get better. Uh, and I met one person who some of you may know, uh, Jake Foley. Does that ring a bell? Uh, he is on the development board for UT. He was on the committee of 125. Uh, and I, I discovered what I'm about to tell you, and you, you may not know this. I hope I'm not telling something out of line. But he comes from a tiny little town near Brownsville. He said, it's a, I don't remember the name of it, but he said it's near something that I hadn't heard of. And it's near something else that I hadn't heard of. But it's a tiny little town, about this population, about the size of Jester. He said it's, uh, it's a farming community, dirt roads connecting it to the highway. But he came to UT with a, a Texas Exit scholarship. And uh, he's obviously a brilliant guy. He has a senior posi uh, position at Deutsche Bank. And as I say, he's very active uh, with UT and a, apparently a generous supporter of it. But, uh, and uh, he is Hispanic, his name doesn't suggest that, but he is Hispanic. And to think how he could have gone from, from where he was to where he is now, it's like going to the moon, essentially. And that's such an extraordinary story. And it's so sad to think that there are kids that have, he, Jake has to be a genius. He's, but, and he came here to study science, and he's on, as I say, on Wall Street. But that is really extraordinary. So I commend you, and I enjoy doing that. And uh, I, I've never been particularly interested in, in money. My career choice illustrates that. But I, I wish I were a billionaire to be able to help more people like that. So anyway, let's get to the, uh, the topic of my, my talk. Uh, and the topic is, is America in moral decline? I'm curious, how many of you uh, agree with me that it is? Okay. Shall we quit and go have coffee? <laughs> uh, well, I, again, I'm both delighted and saddened because I, I have hoped uh, I, that I'm wrong, um, that I'm in my, uh, as I get older, I, I get grumpier, and I, I would hope it would be that, but I, sadly, I don't think it, I don't think it's the case, and, uh, so I want to, to, uh, talk, talk about that, and again, I, I welcome uh, your input, because one of the, the major reasons I came here was that I, I'd li like to hear from you and uh, see, wh among other things, what you base your opinions upon. And I would also, I have a list of books here I'll, t I'll tell you about, and uh, I welcome your recommendation of 
of uh, books to me. I was talking with some of you before we began, and uh, several books were recommended, and I would invite that, and I would ask if uh, my reading has become very focused. It's all nonfiction now, and it's related to the area I'm talking about. And uh, so, uh, please, I wouldn't have time to read fiction, but if you have things that you recommend that are relevant to what we're talking about, I would greatly appreciate them. Let me just tell you a little bit about these books. If they were in color and it's, uh, they're a bit hard to read, but I will go over each of them very briefly with you. Uh, the first one is called The Lucifer Effect, written by a psychologist named Zambardo who is at Stanford and he did something that's now known as the Stanford Prison or exper Experiment. And he essentially had a, what is called a simulation. It was role playing where he selected some students to go into uh, a building and some of them were to be the prisoners and some of them were to be the prison guards. And he was appalled at what happened, that there was a complete metamorphosis of both groups and they conform to the worst stereotypes we have of both prisoners and of prison guards. And this transpired over just a few days and they were randomly assigned. So there was nothing special about them other than their conditions. Uh, the book is fascinating and extremely poorly edited. Uh, so about half of it goes into tedious detail about the exp experiments. Uh, I would s skip that, read a little of it, and skip to the heart of the book, which is the second half. And it's about the, the, the basic point uh, that the, uh, in Western civilization, if somebody does something wrong, for the most part, we consider them bad apples. There's something wrong with them. But he says, oftentimes, uh, people do bad things, not because they're bad people, but because they're in bad barrels. And he says the problem with at Guantanamo and other places weren't that these uh, people taking the photographs and abusing the prisoners were uh, sadists, but they were rather put in a, a, an untenable situation that make them behave like that. And I think it's a superb uh, idea, a scary one too that you can have institutional evil or institutional dishonesty and so forth. And I, I think uh, Enron was an example of that. Uh, I am director of the honors program as was mentioned. There are two very distinguished grads of that program graduated from the honors program and the uh, accounting program in the early 80s, and you know both of them uh, by reputation. Uh, one is Sharon Watkins, you remember her? The whistleblower. The other one is Rick Causey, remember him? He was the chief accounting officer for Enron. I've uh, met Sharon, she's spoken to students. I have not met Rick, uh, but from what I know about him, I think he's must be a fine man, but he got himself into a real mess. And I would say that Enron was a bad barrel. And a lot of young people were essentially drank the Kool-Aid, bought into that, and were uh, corrupted by it. Uh, I have a, a, a student, by, by the way, one of my real, in fact, my life goal right now is to talk about this stuff because I'm, I'm quite worried about it. But I had a student come up to me uh, after giving a, a lecture and, uh, or a sermon maybe. The, uh, and she, she said that she was a uh, business honor student and she'd had an internship with one of the big four accounting firms. And they had just finished a very large project and they were sort of having a wrap up meeting at the end of it and uh, there were about a dozen in there 
the most senior was a partner and then there were associates and then she was an intern and she was sitting appropriately at the end of the table and the partner was at the top. And the partner uh, said, you know, there's a senior partner who was supposed to be responsible for this project, but he did not have time to work on it. If we turn in our, our bill and sh show that he has no billable hours, it will be a great embarrassment to him and the company. So what I will do will be I will uh, assign some of my hours to him. And he uh, had the papers there to do this. And then he gave them to my student, former, uh, she was my student at the time, and said, would you sign them? Anybody, any CPAs in here? So any problems with that? <laughs> Please, what, t tell me, or elaborate. And, and there's no way uh, she should sign that, and he shouldn't have asked her. And why is that? It's false. It's false. Yeah, it, 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 it's, first of all, it, it's false, but it, it's dishonest. But there's also another word for it, isn't it? Anyway, for, uh, it's fraud. For one, uh, the senior partner gets his billable rate is greater than the partner's. So it's more money. Uh, and if you saw the firm, that d d uh, the uh, law firm that, that was the front for the mafia didn't. Yes, ma'am. As a lawyer, I can tell you it's an ethical violation. Yes. And in, in the firm, those guys went to jail because doing it over interstate commerce is, is fraud. And so you can go to jail. Why would that guy have done that? Why would that partner have asked her to do that? Beg your pardon? He was being pressured from the senior. He may well have, I, I bet that's probably true. I don't, that didn't come into the picture, but it may well have been. Could he have been policy. testing her? He had the most Out of policy. Ego. Ego. He thought he could get away with it. I think he was using the senior. He thought he could pressure. I think that's it. The fact that she, and, to my mind, there were two explana possible explanations, and we could decide which is most plausible. One, it was a, a test for her, and a test to see if she had the, the moral strength to stand up in that group. The other one is that she was the most vulnerable. All the others had jobs. She didn't. She was hoping to get one job, a job there, until then, by the way. Uh, and so he could pressure her to do it. And what would be the advantage of having her do it versus an associate in the room? She, he, she's expendable, and he, she should also say, well, in our uh, accounting classes, we talked about that, but she probably missed that day. She was on an interview or something. And so she didn't learn about this ethical stuff. Uh, so it, the deniability of that would be greater if she signed it than if somebody who had had more experience. So put yourself in that situation. You're 21. You've been killing yourself doing business honors and the MPA program, top accounting program in the country. You've always admired this firm. You're probably going to get an offer. All these people are staring at you and you got to sign that paper. What do you do? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, uh, but I sincerely question whether I'd have the moral courage to, to resist. What she did was very clever. She took the paper and held it, and the meeting dispersed, and then she told the person that she reported to directly that she couldn't sign it. So she resisted the pressure. And then she's now working for a consulting firm in New York. She left that, that company. So I, and I've talked to several accounting professors and they said that was, they thought it was, they were trying to get her to engage in fraud. It wasn't a moral test. Uh, it, and it's probably be an unfair one too, I would think. 
Uh, but at any rate, I, she saw that uh, company as a rotten barrel and, and chose uh, to leave it. But the, the pressures are so great. How many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies? Any of you? It's the Lord of the Rings. I, th I think that money is that ring, if you've seen it. And the ring made people go crazy to, in desiring it. And I think money uh, does that to people. And it makes them shut off their reasoning. And I, there's a lot of emphasis uh, I'll talk about in a little bit about rationality of so-called economic man. But I think a lot of us are highly irrational and don't even know it. Uh, just as an illustration of it, I was asked once to be an umpire in a little league game where my, my son was playing. And it, it was, I try to be honest, but I swear that those kids on the other team were not tagging the bases when they were. It's, so I, I swore I'd never do that again. And, uh, but I think, you know, it, it, if it's not declared immoral, it's thinking outside of the box or going the extra mile or whatever the euphemism is, and everybody's doing it, and there's millions in for it, uh, millions of dollars in it for you, I think that's very, very, very tough. Uh, anyway, that's what we'll, we'll take all day if that's just one book. Yeah. So are, are you recommending your students not go to this unnamed bad barrel, or are you I, this information? I, I, the question was, have I shared this information with other students who might find themselves in that bad barrel? And that story was told to me in confidence. And so I, I really, I can't. But what I, I try to do is to make sure the student's antenna are up uh, so that they, can, they look at, the, at these questions and identify the, for example, some, bus some businesses use unethical or unprofessional recruiting methods to hire our business students. If their recruiting smells, there are other things in those companies that smell, so they have to be, be attentive to that. And further, I, I would not indict the whole company because of, of one partner. So it, he may be uh, an anomaly. I don't I, I won't pass judgment on that. Yes, sir. I was one of a small number of people who did not raise my hand when you asked whether, I, whether we thought the country was in moral decline, uh, because I was thinking of a book by an old California friend of mine named Dizikas, D-I-Z-I-K-E-S, uh, called Sportsman and Gamesman, a comparative history of British and American sports over the last 200 years, in which the thesis is that the Brits do sports uh, for two reasons, to build strength in young athletes uh, and to inculcate sportsmanship in the population. Whereas Americans do sports, we Americans do sports back early in the 19th century and in the meantime, to win. Have you ever seen Brits in a soccer game? <laughs> <laughs> A very good retort, and that's uh, well. I so uh, what you're saying is that the moral decline began early. Uh, but no, I I think that, and my, my information I can only argue anecdotally. But just my observations are, for for example, I think that. Um, the uh, about 70% of high school kids and about 70% of college kids cheat. And I, they've been cheating forever, but the degree of cheating and the ease of cheating that I see now is, is astonishing. And uh, they, they will, in a class, they will wholesale help each other to cheat. That doesn't sound very smart to me. 
Because if, if you find a copy, old copy of the test, you want to keep it to yourself. But the, the ease of which the students are doing it is really, is really troubling to me. And whenever there's a, a public or a general ethics test in this country, uh, I think we, we fail, whether we did 100 years ago or not. Yeah, I have a question that we have a problem in the area that you're addressing. Uh, my, problem, my question is, how far does this go back? <laughs> and, I, and I don't know the answer. And I think it's, uh, I don't either. Uh, but, but it'll be on the test. test. <laughs> uh, but but uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, very good. I, in fact, the, that's a, I've, I've thought about doing that with the students. I, I say, you all cheat, so do I. I'll sell my test to one of you. Who who will bid 100? I should do that. And just bid it up, because they assume we're all honest. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's, uh, I think it's probably 58, but you went somewhere between 56 and 60. The government exams, what was the So, but and I, uh, I'm, I'm right as you might may have guessed. I'm writing a book on this, and it, the the crescendo uh, was the dot com bust, Enron, WorldCom, all of that. But I'm having, uh, I can't. Res I'm having a new chapter in the book. I couldn't resist the pun. Bernie made off with billions. Don't you, you like that? Uh, but there's, there's new grounds for it. But my concern is not so much that there are big crooks stealing lots of money. Just in my casual observation, there is a decline in people's respect for anything and lots of things particularly, like people occupying, I ride the city bus occasionally to go home, uh, and people occupying the handicap uh, spaces on the bus and not getting up. And I saw a guy leave a, a shopping mall, and, or actually it was a HEB, and he took his cart and pushed it into the handicap parking slot and uh, drove away. Those, now that two data points doesn't make this point, but I see so few uh, countervailing data points. By the way, the, the metaphor I have for this is a, is a scrum. Anybody know what a scrum is? Yes, it's in rugby. And it's, it's the equivalent of a, the, the uh, j jump ball in basketball. And all of one team lines up on each other. There's a, a front line on one side. And all the other team line up on the other side, and there's a, it's almost like a Roman arch with all these people on each other. And then they throw the ball in the middle, and they use their feet to pull the ball back. And I view our, our metaphorically, we're in a, a scrum, and the ball is our nation's soul. And there are lots of people on one side and there are lots of people on the other. And the question is, uh, who's gonna win? And the, the number of players is equivalent and fixed in rugby, but it's not in our, uh, in our nation. And I think there are always ebbs and flows. And I believe that we, there was the Gilded Age the age of the robber barons, the intellectual foundation for that was uh, uh, 
social Darwinism, the notion that inferiors are essentially eliminated from life or eliminated from uh, the business world, and that's good in the long run. Uh, and I think we're in the Gilded Age too, and there is a new Dar Darwinistic view that is providing an intellectual foundation to it. And I, I personally believe that uh, the business school in particular, but uh, universities generally uh, unconsciously uh, or unknowingly are contributing to that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But a good, uh, let me just talk about some of these books. Another book is quite old. Uh, it's a wonderful book, bestseller. I suspect many of you read it. It's called The Selfish Gene. And essentially it is about, it's, it's Darwinistic, but about how uh, the purpose of life is to perpetuate itself. Apparently, uh, Jeff Skilling of Enron uh, said this, is reported to have said this was his favorite book. And uh, it, again, is sort of a, a antagonistic view of, of business. And in a more recent book, Dawkins, uh, acknowledges that and, and says that he was repelled by it. And if you read The Selfish Gene carefully, it could have easily, that, the, the publisher put that title on his book. No author ever titles their book. The publisher did that, and that's a grabby title. But it could have been called The Social Gene equally well, uh, because we're not all killing each other. Uh, another excellent book, is uh, Moral Minds. It's written by a evolutionary biologist at Harvard named Mark Hauser. And he essentially says that the battle of good and, and bad uh, in humans are, is a battle of different parts of the brain. And we have animal parts of our brain and human parts of our brain, and that's really where it's taking place. He also has claims that we are biologically designed to, to be social animals, to live with each other, and that, in fact, uh, that not inconsistent with what uh, Dawkins said, and that uh, we, there's a linguist called Noam Chomsky who said that we were to use a computer analogy, we're hardwired to have a language. That languages obviously vary uh, immensely across the world, but everybody has a language. Every society has one because we're hardwired and then by analogy, the software is the individual language because we need language and it's a part of being human. Hauser says the same thing is true with socially responsible or ethical or moral behavior. We're hardwired to be responsive to the needs of others. Our particular ethical code is analogous to the particular languages that they vary immensely. What is moral in one country, polygamy, for example, is not in another. But everybody has ethics. Uh, the Battle for the Soul of Capitalism, that is written by a guy named Bogle, who is the founder of Vanguard, and he makes an extraordinary uh, claim that we have shifted from what he calls uh, stockholders' capitalism to uh, managers' capitalism. Now, the theory behind capitalism and the corporation is that uh, there's a separation of ownership and manage, management. And so lots of people have, will own, what, what's a good company to pick? I started to say GM, but GE. And uh, since we all can't, as owners in that, we all can't participate in the supervision of that company, we elect representatives. And instead of having one person, one vote, we have one 
uh, share one vote, so people vote more than others, and they oversee the managers and make sure they're custodians of our money. That's the conception of, of uh, stockholders' capitalism. But the way the law is designed right now, the, it's managers' corporations, and uh, any owner of stock, any company owner who tries to exercise their rights are viewed as renegades. And so even uh, nominating members to serve on corporate boards is, for all practical purposes, impossible. And that explains, uh, according to him, and there's another book here uh, in the bottom left, Pay Without Performance, it makes the same basic point, that the corporate boards are now chosen by the top management and the group they serve is not the owners of the corporation, but the managers of the corporation. And that explains why uh, somebody can get, do a lousy job, get fired, and then get a big bonus for, for the poor work. Or why a company can go down the toilet and the managers still get big corporate bonuses and big salaries and so forth. Uh, so the point of, the, of those books is that some of this stuff is, I fear, institutionalized. Uh, the book in the middle, Moral, uh, is Trust by Francis Fukuyama, and he claims that there is a critical mass of trust that is required for society to function. And it, he defines trust as the ability to trust strangers. And uh, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. But I have a stack of papers at home about like this that is the only indication out of all my savings and, and wealth that I plan on to, uh, I will rely on when I retire. And uh, on that are you know valuations of various things, and I'm highly diversified. So I'm relying on hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, to be honest to protect my wealth. And uh, it's only as that money that I hope I have is only as good as uh, those people are honest in producing the results. So so when WorldCom goes bust, it comes. And you all are in the same way, uh, same situation. It comes out of our, our hide. So uh, it's, a, it's a superb book. And he also talks about how the level of trust varies from one culture to the next and how uh, there are essentially th three alternatives. One is that there is abundant trust and so you need no government regulation. That's the ideal of a laissez-faire government, that we're all honest, so we, in fact, Steve and I were talking about the day when uh, a three-page contract would work when you need a 200-page contract today that doesn't work, and how a handshake would be, would be sufficient anyway. Uh, sadly, that is, uh, that is gone. So one is trust, the other, is anarchy. There, uh, there's laissez-faire economics in Somalia right now. All you need is a, an Uzi and you can, you can get that car. Uh, and then the third option is uh, a strong government. And uh, if people really can't be trusted, it has to be really a strong government. And so when, uh, when we make decisions individually about doing the right thing or the wrong thing, we implicitly and collectively, we're choosing among those three options. And uh, so talking about the problems on Wall Street right now, uh, there's increased regulation. It's going to stink on the one hand. On the other hand, those guys messed it up when they were trusted to operate on their own and we have to have some kind of response. It's going to reduce economic uh, 
performance in this country. There's no doubt about that. But it, it's designed to stop thugs. The Cheating Culture, it's a, a book about the rising uh, incidents of cheating everywhere in our, our country. And again, uh, the cheating in, among uh, students is a prime example of that. I was talking recently, I, I'm having the great pleasure of teaching a, and, uh, teaching a freshman seminar this fall in uh, the signature course. And I've only sem uh, seminars I've ever taught were doctoral seminars. So I'm scared to hold my own in a room of 17 year olds for a semester. But I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, the title is going to be uh, Ethics and Business. I thought about ethics in business, ethics or business. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, what we'll be talking about. But I was uh, in a meeting with other people who would be teaching one of these courses, and a woman told me that her husband is a headmaster for a very fine private school here in Austin, and they caught a young man of, of cheating. Uh, and he was from a very prominent family. And the father came in and said, what's wrong with that? What is important is not how you got there, but the result you got. What's wrong with that? Now, I, in my naivete, I thought that kids were brought up in proper families and they were led astray by the college campus, as I was. Uh, <laughs> but think about that poor kid. Think about what, what will, could happen to him. He has all the advantages, but the really the, the important ones. And the fact that somebody could say that without being embarrassed is quite, quite extraordinary. And it's, it's a, a phony argument, obviously, because what happens if the kid had stolen money from other st of his classmates? Well, he got the money, so it's all right to steal. So it's, anyway. Um, this uh, book is, again, very hard to read, but it's Freud. Uh, I can't even read it myself now. But it's about the uh, Freud's view of morals uh, and of ethics. It's a very interesting book. I've just finished reading it. It's a very troubling one. Um, I'll say, beg your pardon? It's, uh, it's the bottom right, and it's written by a guy named Rice, Philip Rice, R-E-I-S-S. -S. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, just a second. Uh, and then the last one are economists basically immoral. Uh, and it's written, uh, that's meant to be an ironic title, it's written by a, an economist who uh, could have saved a lot of time and just said yes. Uh, no. Now actually, he, his arg it's a very fine book and he argues that no they're not. Uh, I would have said yes they are. But let me, let me get to that. Uh, these, some economic concepts I want to talk about in just a minute. How are we doing on time? It's 10.15 is when we... Okay. Uh, marginal utility. The, uh, if I'm without shoes, the contribution to the quality of my life of getting a pair of shoes is extraordinary. Uh, you know, I cut feet, frozen feet, whatever, insects, whatever. Is, so the contribution of the first pair of shoes is immense in terms of, of utility or value to me. The second pair, I, I might, my, if I could have one pair, I'd choose a pair of work shoes. The second pair, I might like something a little dressier, uh, a little nicer. It'd be great to have that, but it doesn't add as much as the second prayer. 
And the, th the third pair, it would be great to have, but I, you know, I, like, I like brown and black and so forth. But the value that it provides me incrementally to my quality of life it declines. And so there's a notion of marginal utility, the increase we get for additional items in a particular category. And then there's the notion of it's, it's a shape like a curve like this. And economists don't talk about this, but it actually declines. Economists say that we're rational, so we would never buy a 12th pair of shoes if we didn't have a place in our closet or the 100th <laughs> pair of shoes. Uh, they, uh, but that's, it does decline. And there is a point at which we get too many things. It's a, it's a nuisance. Um, that's a very important concept. And the point where that utility is maximized is called the, the point of satiation. And, I beg your pardon? Satiation, where we're sa satiated. And uh, that term takes more meaning if you think about that curve uh, also as the number of drinks we have. <laughs> and, and that's a good illustration of declining marginal utility, by the way. Um, now, what, what happens, or what, how do we describe someone for whom that doesn't decline? Insatiable. They're insatiable, but, they're, but there's something, isn't there something kind of pathological, not always, but often, about that? That you have to have, like, Imelda Marcus's shoes? Obsessive. Obsessive, exactly right. So in, in theory, uh, that's a very, our addiction. You know, somebody that's taking crack cocaine, there's, there, there's never enough. The point of satiation is death. Uh, so th there's this decline. So the, there's the notion that we should be able to take care of our most important uh, tangible or physical needs on that curve. And if it goes on forever, there are reasons to have, you know, there are people who collect shoes or who need them for their work, and there are Jay Leno's who collect cars, it's not just to drive, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're insatiable, that's a problem. And I think for a lot of, of people, unfortunately, there, there are, is no diminishing returns for money. Now, if everything you want has a point of satiation, there ought to be a, f a finite amount of money that's enough. And for me, it might be $100,000. For somebody else, it might be $100 million. But there ought to be some point. But I think for some, n no amount is ever enough. And I say that, that's an addiction. What is it, the guy from Houston, Oscar Wyatt, is that his name? He went to jail for bribery, a billionaire in his 80s. Why bribe? Yes, sir. There is a problem with being satisfied with money, and that is that we, we have a government that insists on printing, so we cannot know what, whether we have enough or not. <laughs> Very good. Yes, and I'm, I'm planning on retiring at the end of next year, and so that's, that is uh, a very serious point uh, for me. And uh, yeah, I know it, you all are uh, in the midst of it right now, so you know it, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, uh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Dr. Cox, I had the opportunity to review your remarks at the NBA alumni Great. And I've been very upset since then. At me? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, I have you included your remarks? <laughs> I 
Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to you that this has been his nature. Yes, sir. Ever since birth. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the capitalistic system. <laughs> and I think yes. there are many in here that will uh, agree with that. But let me say, let me say this. It's, it's capitalists like that that destroy capitalism. Yes, sir. Uh, what has upset me about your remarks are that I have taken it as a personal affront Capitalism. No. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering two questions, if you would put Has this, I think you somewhat addressed this previously, but this has been going on ever since the United States was formed, if you will. Some type of capitalistic approach. And it all of a sudden it strikes me that, that all these crooks. New York and D.C. that are taking this big money. It's upsetting, I'm sure, the whole population. Everybody's, including our government, possibly. But it, it's very upsetting to me that the only remedy for this is going to be the government. And it, yes. And, I, and going back further, would you go so far as to say that may, it may be the psychological embedded greed within all of us. No. <laughs> oh, other? No. No, let, let, uh, I'm just playing with you. But let me say that I'm a free market capitalist. Uh, and I believe that's the best system. It's the most productive system. It allows for the most freedom. But it can be messed up, and I think we're going out of our way to mess it up. And it, we've always had some people like this. But I think, in fact, uh, in response to the meltdown, I wrote an essay uh, called Pogo Economics. And, you know, I saw the enemy, and the enemy is us, or whatever the Pogo statement was. Uh, and I think the, the amount of greed in this country is, is crazy. And the people who were, uh, you know, buying the houses that they sh never should have bought and their uh, mortgage brokers were telling people to lie on their applications so they could get bigger houses and the mortgage broker would get the commission from both parties, by the way, and uh, wash his or her hands of the deal and then it goes to the, uh, the bank or whoever that, uh, originates the loan and then they sell it off so they have no responsibility for it and it goes all the way up to the derivatives and so forth where it, and it was it was insanity and uh, so I, I I think the real problem is it's not that they're just a few crooks but there are lots of crooks and th there is this notion perpetuated we really haven't talked about and don't have time to talk about but this so-called economic man, that a so-called economic man is perfectly selfish and perfectly rational. And we go out and do whatever is needed to make ourselves rich. We don't care about anybody else. And so uh, the uh, free enterprise system cleans up all the mess. The invisible hand that Adam Smith talks about cleans all of that, that stuff up. And uh, so I agree with you fully but I think we are messing up stuff. And every time there's an abuse, the government comes in and does a fix that, that is not a good, yes, it, and it, their government regulation is good. We, we definitely need that. But it's always an imperfect system and there are always, the part of the problem is the, uh, the fox are, are in the hen house that do the legislation. So a lot of the legislation is self-serving is self -serving as well. And the people who work in Washington have their own agendas because they, if they're economic men, their uh, objective is to make the most money they can, not to make it good for us. And the same is true with people in business. And managers increasingly are interested in, in enriching themselves and not enriching stockholders. So 
I, and I think it's pervasive. And we, there's a lot of criticism of these stupid people who bought houses they should never have bought, but then these investment banks were leveraging it 40 to 1. Imagine going to a bank and saying, uh, my net worth is a million. I want to borrow 40 million to invest in one option in whatever it is. You'd be laughed out. And then these PhDs in math were, you know, building these things that will enable people to do that. It's, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. They couldn't get into UT, so they, yeah, I, but, but I, and it's, this is so complex that uh, it's hard to, to represent all of it. But let me just, something I did say, and I hope it resonates was I think a, a good metaphor, and many people, Milton Friedman, Adam Smith, and many others have used sports as a metaphor for free enterprise. And the true, the closest parallel to laissez-faire economics, it, to my mind, is golf. Because they are gentlemen, and they, there is a social code, and if somebody's not playing right, the, that player will be ostracized. And if you watch the, uh, the open, you, you don't see, or it takes real attention to notice the, uh, the officials. You know, they're in the distance, they're unobtrusive, they, for the most part, they never interfere. And, but the competition is ruthless. And then there are other sports, and I, as I mentioned in Houston, the, to my mind, the worst is uh, professional basketball because they influence every single game and throughout the game, the, the officials do, and if there were no officials, it would, there'd be murder. <laughs> they would. And uh, I, I, in fact, I, I heard this story when I mentioned the Houston, but I did some, I, when I was in uh, high school, my foolish young PE teacher, I'm gonna move back up here, pardon me. My foolish young PE teacher said, let us play something called marine basketball. It was raining, so we couldn't get outside. And the marine basketball, there was one rule. You get the ball in the hoop, you score. And he, was, he blew his whistle. He shocked. He stopped it after a few minutes because we went crazy. And I remember I had a friend in a headlock. <laughs> and uh, so the difference between... Uh, golf and basketball is the sportsmanship. The rules are internal to the golfers. And there is no restraint from the basketball players. All the restraint comes from the, the officials. And you do whatever they let you do. Uh, and you get lots of tries. Uh, some, and I'm, some fouling is all right in basketball. But generally, just the chaos there. Uh, and a very interesting point was made uh, in when I, I asked rhetorically the group what was the worst sport, and uh, one young man said it was hockey, and that's probably a, a, would be a good substitute for uh, for basketball because those guys have weapons, <laughs> and uh, so imagine there were no referees in hockey. It would be a good thing that the fans had those. That was protections around them. Yes, ma'am. I lived on the top of a building in San Antonio that overlooked the Fort San Houston golf course. And I sprained or broke a, an ankle. So I spent six weeks looking out the window. And this was where officers played. You also had an additional honor code yes. in the military. And there was a little mob of trees between the fence and where you uh, hit the ball. And lots of people would land their ball there and go get it. And I never saw anybody go if they didn't come back to an improved position. <laughs> Amateur golf is in a different category. Yeah, I think so. I, 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 yeah, I'm a reformed golfer myself. So, in fact, I, 
I was so bad that I quit. I, I came up with my own measure of keeping score, and I would keep count of the number of balls I'd lose. <laughs> so a five would be a pretty good day for me. <laughs> but it's, uh, anyway, it's, it's rough. Uh, I've already mentioned economic man, and this is, this is at the heart of the problem and uh, that I believe, and it's, uh, it's made explicit in economics that, w that a person behaving in an economic context is, uh, the model for the person is perfectly selfish and perfectly rational. And so that means it's irrational not to be selfish. And this is traced back to Adam Smith, and he would be repelled by that view. He wrote expressly against it, but that's taught. And it's done innocently in economics, it's explicit, it's implicit in business. So the ethical dimensions and the legal dimensions are rarely raised in business decisions. So we focus on maximizing profit or NPV or whatever it is, but we don't say who will be hurt by this? Well, is this ethical? We need to have a decision-making framework to, to explicitly address those things. And then that view is uh, perpetuated throughout school, especially in liberal arts. It's called uh, behavioral decision-making. And it, again, the typical person in that model is assumed to be selfish and rational. So it's implicit. But, uh, by the way, there's been research showing that economic ma uh, majors tend to be more selfish than others. <laughs> they learn, they, they inculcate that. That's presumably a, a descriptor, but if it's taught as a way to behave and you're irrational not behaving that, it's, it's a, a problem. So I think uh, that we educators need to be explicit about that, and I think all of, all of us do. And I think we need to speak out on behalf of this, and I think it's our, our patriotic duty. There is a very fascinating study that was done with traffic tickets in New York City. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was a uh, remarkable so-called natural experiment, but uh, diplomats don't have to pay for traffic tickets. So the question, the, the rhetorical question of the research hypothesis was, are people equally conscientious by country in terms of obeying the traffic laws when there are no consequences for not doing them? And uh, so some researchers from NYU went through and, and categorized the tickets by country. And they found that some countries they didn't get any tickets. And other countries, they were very abusive. They, they'd get, people would get hundreds of them. And uh, where do you think the countries were where there were no tickets? Yes, yes, absolutely right. Scandinavia and, and Japan. And you know where the places were where there was uh, flagrant traffic abuse. Yes, it, it essentially developing countries, and some of the worst were in Africa. And in another point, if the situation is destitute, if I lived in Somalia, I would be economic man because my survival is on the line. But in a country with abundance, we don't need to behave that way. There's enough for everybody. And in fact, the, the amount we make is more if we all play by the, the, the rules. Then we don't need all this government regulation and so forth. So Adam Smith said that dishonesty is like rust in a machine. And, uh, but we're so focused, sadly, on our individual behavior, we're not doing well. Uh, just quickly, since I'm almost out of time. A major problem is the so-called principal agent problem, and that is I'm the principal if somebody is working on my behalf as an agent. Now, presumably that person 
is working to fulfill my interests. But what if that person is an economic man? Then his goal is not to help me, but to, to benefit himself. There's a, a related concept of fiduciary duties, and that is certain professions have moral responsibilities and ethical codes to work in the interest of their clients, like accounting firms, and there are many others. Uh, the, uh, yes, usually it's referred to uh, where in the economic context, but those, those problems exist uh, throughout. But one of the problems is, uh, say, I'm a, a trustee for an estate for a young child whose parents were killed in an automobile accident. Uh, this is not true. And the, there was a settlement, and the child has $5 million. And that is the money that's going to take care of that kid forever. And I'm the trustee. I handle that, that, uh, that money. What do I do if I'm an economic man? And my, I have to be perfectly selfish and perfectly rational. What am I going to do? I'm going to feed off that kid's trust. And one of, the, one of the, the difficulties is a lot of these intermediaries that have these responsibilities, like the rating agencies, like the public accounting firms, financial advisors, and so forth, they have fiduciary duties and honor codes, but if they're motivated by the profit motive, then it, it's, it's scary. I tell my accounting friends that letting a company choose their auditor is like letting children choose their babysitter. <laughs> or if any of you were in a fraternity back in the days when there were house mothers, letting the fraternity boys choose their house mother. <laughs> that, that would have been fun. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a, a book that addresses that question. You probably have seen it called Freakonomics. Yes. Which the thesis is that we all operate in our own self-interest. That's the bottom line. Well, if that's true, then I'm, I'm right. We are in moral decline. And Milton Friedman said, society works if most of us go about doing the right thing without making these calculations. We do it because we're honest. And we, we value the institutions that honesty uh, supports. Uh, yes, sir. Pardon me. Oh. Even if you're an economic man, meaning, I guess, selfish, it looks like if you think long-term, uh, the advantage, let's say you're, you know, you're responsible for a, a kid that has a $5 million trust, uh, in the long run, it would seem that, that there would be economic advantage for you if you did not cheat. Uh, because then you'd be, you would hopefully have other people who would respect the fact that you didn't cheat and that you in the future would get more $5 million trust. I, ideally, that would be the case. But I, and that's a very sophisticated view that not a, everyone uh, shares. And there are lots of people who don't do that. And it, again, it, the, the problem is not just the individual case, but the institutional problem. And if, if I can't trust anybody in the business world, then what do I do with my money? Exactly. Uh, what I'm saying is that if, if people were taught to think long term, yes. it would be in their economic man advantage uh, not to cheat. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But sadly, not enough people hold that view. Why, why is there not an emphasis on teaching uh, long-term long -term planning and thinking as opposed to the short-term cheat now? Well, I think we need to do more of that. Yeah, yeah, sadly. Yeah, you, you had your hand up? I think the <coughs> issue is fairly simplistic in the been a disassociation of risk and reward. And our society has moved away from there is no there is no risk for, for seeking a reward. It's made off being a simple example. 
he has, he has embezzled millions of dollars. And I read the newspaper recently, his attorney says the fair punishment is 12 years in prison. There's no, there's, yeah. no, there's no commensurate punishment or risk associated with the reward we see. You can talk about dollars, you can talk about Enron, you can talk about Sadly. When, when Adam Smith was alive, there were uh, 180 crimes that were punishable by capital punishment. So my, the redneck in me really comes out because I, I think we shouldn't have any rules, but when people really mess up, we ought to string them up. <laughs> no, I, I mean that rhetorically, but really, I, you know, I, I think what we should do to Madoff should be done to the extent that everybody else shudders. Yeah. yeah, sadly, yes, sir. <laughs> Time. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.